right. Good morning, church. Let's try that again. I know it's the holiday weekend. Josh, glad you could join us. Good morning, church. Glad you're here. Glad you've carved out a little bit of time in between your barbecues and uh, different activities today. Glad you're here and worshiping with us. If you're a guest or a visitor, uh, maybe some family members pulled you in. Glad that you're here. We'll give you some announcements at the end. I'll let you know some things that are going on in the church. We have uh, kicked off a brand new series called Spaces and Rhythms, and we're trying to make room. Hey, Hunter. Good to have you back, buddy. I was thinking about you this morning. Anyway, a um, little side note there. Anyway, uh, we're looking to make room for the divine. Uh, I don't know if you ever think of yourself as the divine. Probably not. Uh, but there's something miraculous when we make room and, and create space and have a rhythm for interacting with the divine. And so what we're doing is we're looking at spiritual disciplines that we are going to uh, make a part of our everyday life in order that we have more of a connection with the divine and, and digging into that. So we're, last week we looked at uh, being in the Word, studying the Word of God. I know uh, several of you actually, praise the Lord, uh, emailed me and said, hey, don't have a Bible. I don't even know where to start. Where should I get a Bible? Which Bible should I get? And we've been able to get you Bibles. Some of you said, I've never even read it. Uh, where should I start? And so it's happening. You guys are doing it. If you brought your Bibles, I'd love you for you just to just raise them up. If you brought your Bibles, just ra- look around the room right here. Look at this. Woo! The Word of God. Yes. Awesome. Very, very cool. So we looked at the importance of the Word. Uh, this week, we're looking at prayer. Then we've got confession, both to God and to one another. We have stewardship, and we have fasting. So it doesn't get any easier. We've got a lot of things to cover. We've got a lot of meat and potatoes to kind of work on, but we're glad that you're here and wrestling. This morning is a, a very special morning for me. Uh, I don't know if you ever have given a presentation in front of like your mom or your dad and you feel that pressure. My fourth grade teacher uh, is here. And, and so if you have ever had a teacher watch you in what you do or come visit you, uh, a little like threatening there to make sure you use the right grammar and the right pauses and, and don't do something that you're going to get a detention for. Uh, and so my fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Jane Dargatz, is right here. So would you please stand? So I... Uh, Again, this has nothing to do with the sermon, but I will say this. You might never know the difference that you are making in a person's life. They might come into your life and then come out of your life, and you might never even think that you made an impact, especially for you teachers uh, in this room and you administrators. In part, I am here because of Mrs. Dargatz. She was the only teacher that believed in me. She was the only teacher that put up with me. She was the only teacher that uh, encouraged me and and saw hope in me. It was only a little, but it was there. (laughs) And I have stayed in communication with Mrs. Dargatz. I have um, thought about her often. I've I've praised God and thanked uh, God for her in my life. And so just for you guys to know, if it's a neighborhood kid or or, uh, one of your kids, one of their friends, you never know that the impact that you're making. And so keep pouring into the next generation um, because you never know uh, what they might do. Okay, enough sappiness. Let's jump. If you have your Bibles, open up to Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Uh, if, you've, if you're new to the Bible, new to church, uh, new to the Gospels, etc., go about halfway to the Bible and then hang a right a couple of inches And you'll hit the book of Romans, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans. This is a longer part of a longer chain of exhortations, but it's important because it gives us our direction for this morning. It says we are to be confident in hope, patient in trouble, keep on or or be devoted, the Greek says, to set apart, to keep on praying. This is our instruction. This is our exhortation for for the Christ followers, for the church, to be confident in the hope that we have, to be patient in our trouble. And some of you, I know this, you are in trouble. 
not in trouble with someone, but life has, has dealt you a, a really difficult hand and life is in trouble. You are to be patient during that time and keep on or be devoted or to be set apart to keep praying. Your, your version, uh, with, if, again, if you're new to the Bible, new to church, there are so many different versions. The New Living Translation, the New International Version, the New King James Version, and the list goes on and on and on. All they do is really reword things the same, but they don't lose the heart of the message. Your version might be, I say, be constant in prayer. Some of you have heard that. Or, or be faithful in in prayer. Those all get to the facets of the word. None of those lose the heart behind the passage. Devoted is a really good translation for this, to be devoted to prayer. We're going to unpack this a little bit so that we understand it. The word used in Mark chapter 3 verse 9, it'll be on the screen, where it says that Jesus instructed his disciples to have a boat ready so that the crowd would not crush him. You go, okay, well, where's the correlation between prayer? I don't understand this. Jesus is a man. Sometimes we can just picture Jesus as this deity walking around with a halo, walking on his head, and he could do and, and, and say anything, and he would be okay. And here we see that Jesus is instructing his disciples, make sure there's a boat ready because the crowd is going to crush me. He's concerned about even his physical being. A boat was to be set apart for him, to be devoted to him for the purpose of taking Jesus away from the crowd when it became threatening. Devoted is a dedicated task for an appointed time. That's what devotion is. You say, well, I'm devoted to running, okay? Well, you don't run everywhere you go. If you do, if you do you're a weirdo, <laughs> Right? You're, you devote your time for a season or for a moment to run. You don't do lunges everywhere you go, although maybe we should start. Be, you devoted a season to that. I did kettlebells at the gym this last week. Almost died. You, know, you guys ever done kettlebell swings? Yeah, they're like of the enemy. It, it, they kill you. Well, no one walks around at Safeway or, or a Lich Gardens or the Rockies game, and you don't bring a kettlebell with you and swing it. You create a devoted time to do that, much like Jesus saying, make sure there's a boat. Now, I'm not a huge boat guy. Any of you guys huge boat people in this room? It's like five of you. Awesome. So I know this about boats. Boats sit there right? They don't do anything unless a human being does something with the boat. And for most boat owners, the boat still just sits there. It's like when, you, all right, here, uh, another thing has nothing to do with sermon. Advice, don't buy a treadmill and don't buy a boat. You're not going to use either of them, Right? It's so much easier to go use someone else's boat or go, to go for a run. Some of you probably have ellipticals and, and, and bikes and treadmills in your basement that has like three inches of dust on it, right? But it's devoted for a certain purpose, a, a certain place in time for you to utilize it. And so same thing for prayer. Let's go to an example. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, Luke talks about the community of believers, these Christ followers. What did their lives look like? What, it, what, what should it look like for us as well? Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says this, all the believers devoted themselves. They did what? They devoted themselves. They set apart. They designated themselves. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Uh, that would be the scriptures and to the fellowship and the sharing of meals and to prayer. That is that they not only designated uh, themselves for a task for God and by God, but are also giving themselves to it. We're going to see this correlation as we continue to move forward. They're devoted. It's life for them. In other words, it wasn't something they, they devoted as in, I'm going to do lunges at this moment. 
but they devoted in the sense that the two of them were tied together. Their lives and prayer were synonymous together. They lived a life of prayer. That's different from our culture. That's different from if you've attended church. And so as we continue to dive into these various uh, spiritual disciplines, these spiritual exercises, if you want to grow in your faith as a follower of Christ, I want to ask you, are you devoted to prayer? I want you to answer that to yourself. Not do you pray, not, not, not do you pray in the morning, not do you pray before your meal, but are you devoted to prayer? A lot of you know that I, in my previous life, I was a police officer with the Ventura Police Department in Southern California. Part of the police academy training is abusive. They, uh, you have to fight and hit you with batons and pepper spray you, and they do this thing called tear gas. Now, have any of you ever been pepper sprayed or tear gas that want to admit it? Some of you? Okay. The four of you, five of you now. Good. All right. We'll have a little... Six of you? No? <laughs> we'll have a little gathering, and I want to hear why. Anyway, part of the police academy is uh, what they do is they introduce you to tear gas. It's very, very different from pepper spray. Pepper spray is literally from Satan himself. It is the worst. I'd rather be hit by batons than pepper sprayed. It is the worst. Tear gas is awful, but it's momentary. And what they do is they, we would walk into this, these barracks, and we would stand around in a circle and we'd uh, have our gas masks on. We'd do a little bit of calisthenics and have these gas masks on. And then the staff would walk in and they would set off canisters of all this tear gas. And they'd wait for the entire kind of barrack to, to fill up with this tear gas. And then they would give us the instruction as they kept their gas masks on. They would say, now remove your gas masks and begin to yell and begin to say kind of your class motto and all this kind of stuff. Well, what happens with tear gas is the immediate moment that it enters into your lungs, you begin to, what I refer as, die. <laughs> okay, there's probably a lot of other words that can be used. The closest thing I can come to is death. Immediately what happens is all of your sinuses, and I'm dying the last two weeks with allergies. Anybody else with sinuses and allergies? Holy moly. Anyway, what happens is that stuff enters into your body and every mucus that is even remotely attached to your body begins to excrete itself from your being. And you cannot breathe. Your eyes are oozing everything that shouldn't ooze from your eyes. It's out your ears. It's out your mouth. It's out your nose. And you're gasping and gasping and gasping. And the staff are laughing. <laughs> and then you've got to somehow make it out of the room to fresh air to where you can recover. And every single person, and it is super funny to watch others go through it. But every single person that is going through it makes as much effort as they can to get out of that barrack to fresh air and you begin to gasp for something clean. You begin to gasp for something pure. You're so absolutely desperate for something that will take care of the pain that you're enduring. You will do anything it takes to get it. And there's a hose, and you begin to hose your face off, and it doesn't really help. It's only time that that stuff can get out of your lungs. And prayer is the gasping for something pure and something good and something clean. Because here's the reality. We live lives here on earth. We have struggles in our marriages. We have divorces. We have abuse. We have mass shootings, again in Texas. We have uh, money laundering. We, ha we have everything that's not good. We have our kids getting exposed to different things at school that we'd rather them not get exposed to. We have hurdles trying to overcome. I think of the hires <laughs> with Amelia. Amelia, we, we are right there. Almost seven years, six and a half years of, of pursuing the adoption of sweet little Amelia in Haiti uh, and the Hires family. They're 
there so close, but it has been hurdle after hurdle after hurdle. Pain. Prayer is being able to breathe that fresh air. Prayer is being able to have something pure come into your being so that you can begin to feel better and, and connect with that entity. Being devoted to prayer does not mean speaking is all you do. I, I've heard so many times uh, people come and go, I'm not very good at praying. I'll say, hey, can you open us in prayer? Oh, I'm not very good at praying. Maybe that might, that might be you. Prayer isn't always speaking. Prayer isn't uh, trying to be eloquent with our words. In fact, if anything, Jesus warned against that, saying, don't go on babbling. Just say it. And so for us, being devoted to prayer doesn't mean all you do is the spoken. It's, it's the life that's dedicated to it. And I would suggest to you prayer is a state of being. You might be going, okay, where's he going with this? It's starting to sound a little weird. State of being. It's who you are. The Bible says if you're devoted to prayer, it's who you are. And I want to just keep asking the question, are you devoted to prayer? You might have seasons, if you're like any of us, let's make sure we're all in the same boat. We all struggle with being devoted to prayer. We all struggle with being devoted to reading the Bible or, or doing what we ought to. There's this silly little thing called sin. It disrupts it. But being devoted to prayer means that there will be a common pattern of praying that looks like devotion to prayer. Again, that's different than, uh, for me as a kid, you guys ever prayed the prayer, now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep, okay? Every night as a kid, I prayed that prayer by myself in my little twin bed and asked Jesus into my heart, just to make sure. Anybody else? Yeah, just to make sure. It was a different time. It was a lot of uh, hellfire and brimstone. And, and, and I did not have an understanding of grace and mercy and redemption and being saved. And so, doggone it, before my eyes closed, I wanted to make sure if, you know, that prayer, if I die before I wake, like that freaked me out like the movie Jaws, right? <laughs> like, man, if I go to sleep right now and I haven't made sure, I don't want to end up somewhere where it's hot. So we pray some of these prayers. We pray some of these prayers sometimes. We, we pray only when there's a crisis. We pray uh, at mealtimes. We, we pray when we're late and it's our fault and we pray for a parking spot. Any of you ever done that? Like, God, if you're real, I know I should have been here 10 minutes ago, but if you are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, show me your power. And God's like, I did 10 minutes ago, but some other guy took it, like, <laughs> right? So we, sometimes we pray these prayers, and that doesn't mean that we're committed and devoted to prayer. And you might say, well, geez, uh, I'm, I'm not Paul. I can't pray all the time. I, I, I'm not good at it. I don't even really know how. And, and even though I'm trying, you keep saying there's more. Isn't it ever good enough for you? Ah, this isn't Brian talking. This is the scriptures talking. It's never good enough. And it will never be good enough until you face Jesus face to face. Philippians says that, that he who created a good work in you is going to continue it. That means there's more work to be done. And you're never done. If you read any of the stories of Billy Graham right before his death, he was still learning. He was still perplexed by scripture. He was still digging in. He was still looking at the scriptures. Please don't ever buy into this idea that you've got it, like I'm done. And church is a place for you to be pushed. This is our training ground. This is where we exercise. This is where we prepare and we worship before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Think about Paul and others throughout Scripture as that coach that you loved but despised. 
You guys ever had, some of you are athletes, some of you wish you were athletes, some of you are so glad you're not an athlete. You ever have that coach where you can't stand them, but you know they're good for you? Or, or that teacher, no offense, but that teacher that you're like, oh my gosh, that teacher drives me nuts, but look how much I know afterwards coming out of the class. That's Paul and that's, a, that's the scriptures. That's why Paul loves to write to these churches in Philippi and Thessalonica and say, you are doing so well, but do more. You are doing so good. You're devoted to prayer. You're hanging in there. You're following Jesus. Now we're going to address this because there's more. Now don't take that in the light of, I have to be acts-based. I have to do things to make God happy with me. It's not the message. The message says if you want more of God, all of God is available to you in his essence, but you yourself need to exercise so that your mind and your body and your soul is absorbing more of God. That's why we do these spiritual disciplines. And so if there's any place where Paul would say, okay, great, but do more, it's in prayer. I don't think there's a single person in this room that would say, I pray enough. I think every one of us would nod our head and say, I could pray more. I ought to pray more. I want to pray more. I don't know how. I'm too busy. I don't know what to say, etc. but I know I ought to pray more. And so we're going to get really, really practical for the rest of our time. I'm going to give you three kind of umbrellas of prayer to apply in your life. You can apply that today. They're all very, very easy. They're all very, very hard. But I'm going to give you three main sections of what this might look like if you decide to make yourself devoted to prayer. The first one is this, is as you pray, do prayers that are both loose and structured. Make sure they're a little bit loose and make sure they're structured. There's a difference between those two. Being devoted to prayer will mean that what you say in your times of prayer will be both planned out and not planned out. It it will be something that, that you're working on on a regular basis. Because sometimes we can say it has to be either or and that's not the case. Loose or structured. You, sometimes you will have so many needs that they just continue to spill out of your mouth so loosely. You're not putting any thought to it. You're just talking and, and giving God requests, 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 because life is really difficult in that moment. So let them fly. Let it be loose. But if you're only free in your prayers, you will eventually become shallow. If there's no thought into your prayer, if you're just babbling, if you're just spewing things out, whatever comes to mind, that's what you say to God, then eventually that's going to become shallow. And so therefore, the structured part of it comes in. On the same hand, if if you only form your prayers, you'll probably become repetitive and empty just going through the motions, and then it becomes religion. Both ways of praying are important, not either or, but both and, loose and structured. By by loose, I mean that you're going to be regularly feeling like pouring out your soul to God. You have so much going on inside So many thoughts, good, bad, ugly, thoughts that you shouldn't have, thoughts that are pleasing and holy to God, struggles, temptations, deaths, and you just want to shout them to God. Can I give you some freedom? God can handle it if you yell at him. Just remember who you're talking to. God can handle you pouring out your heart to him. We see it all the time in the Psalms of this heart that's just being released with no dam, 
No pumping of the brakes. Just an outpouring to God. Please give yourself the freedom to do that. You want to know one of the greatest places to do it? Go out our door, hang a right, and look at the mountainside. Some of you go, well, I don't like to hike. No problem. Drive up there. Park. And pour your heart out to God. We live in God's playground. Every river, every boulder, every beautiful tree, every meadow is at our fingertips. If you're struggling to pour your heart out in the confines of your home, get out of your home. It's like the kid who says, it hurts when I do this. You go, well, don't do that. It won't hurt then. If it's a struggle in your home, get out of your home. This is important because if all of our prayers are structured, set up for a period of time, and a recital of what we ought to say to God, I want you to picture what that relationship might look like. Think of Sandy and I. Sandy and I get together, and we sit across from the table, and I pull out my note card, and I recite something that I've prepared for her. And it's not like a poem. It's everyday life, but it's written down and it's robotic. And then she, in response, pulls out a card and recites that back to me. We do that a few times. We put our heads down and we eat our dinner and that's our conversation. What kind of a relationship do you think that would end up being like? Synthetic? What's that? Superficial. Superficial. Just not much substance to it. Now, there's a time for it. There's a time for, for structure, repetitive prayer, but make sure it's also loose. On the, on the other hand, on, on, on this regard, I want you to not think of yourself so put together, so spiritual, so smart that, man, you can just say whatever comes on the top of your head, you can just say it loosely and never think about what you're saying. Because if Sandy and I had that relationship, how do you think that would go? <laughs> Chaotic. Chaotic at best. Because is everything that comes to your mind supposed to be spoken? I'll ask you again. Is everything that you think of supposed to be spoken? Then why do we think sometimes that it is with God? even if it's good. If nothing else this morning, I want to encourage you, think about what you say to God. If you want to praise Him for who He is, then be intentional with that. But don't recite someone else's prayer. Don't say things you've heard someone. Talk to your God. And so prayer is both loose and structured. Number two, it is both alone and together. For the growing follower of Jesus, for someone who is, is, is trying to work on this spiritual discipline of prayer, it is both alone and it's together. There's some unbelievable value in being together in prayer. It helps us understand, especially when we're a new believer, a new follower of Jesus, it helps us. Because when you're brand new to Christ, it's like, yeah, hey, God, I got nothing. I don't know what to say to you. I don't even know how to pray. And so there's some value in being together. It's crucial, though, that you meet with Christ one-on-one. -on -one. It is crucial if you want to grow in your relationship with Jesus that you alone are meeting with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That you are hearing his voice. That you are being uh, called on the table on things. That you are being encouraged. That you are being loved. That you are being lifted up. That you are being supported. 
that you are being slapped on your hand and knocked up the side of your head. God does that in our alone time with him. Because without him, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, life becomes habit. And habit is one of the greatest areas where the enemy is winning in life today. How many of you wake up and this is the first thing you grab? You don't have to raise your hand. But thank you for your honesty, Karen. Or fill in the blank. I don't know what it is. But the enemy uses our habits. He uses our routine. And sometimes we have to decide, I am going to get alone time with God. I don't care what it costs me. You guys know who Susanna Wesley is? This is, this is not a real picture. <laughs> she lived a long, long time ago. Susanna Wesley had 16 children. Any of you want to complain now? She had 16 children, and on a regular basis, in the midst of her kitchen, she used to take her apron. Maybe we need to go back to aprons. That is not intentional towards anyone, okay? Can't believe I just said that. Scratch that from the record. Men should wear the aprons. All right, gosh, she would take, I'm not, I'm not suggesting anything with that, okay? I'm just saying because of what's about to happen. She would take her apron, she would pull it over her head in the midst of her chaotic 16 kids, and they learned when mom has the apron over her head, that's my time with Jesus. And they were silent, They learned mom needs some time with Jesus. It's not going to be planned. It's right now because either I get time with Jesus or I hurt you. <laughs> so the apron goes over. The kids go, Ooh, whoa, she spent time with Jesus right now. <laughs> it is so important for our kids to know and to see that, that you have alone time with Jesus so that they see you and you go, hey, hold on a second. I need to pray. Hold on a second. I have got to get with Jesus right now. You need to wait. Those kids learned. Two of those kids were John and Charles Wesley. Went on to be heroes in the faith. Incredible authors. Started churches. Evangelists. And I believe with all my heart that they saw something in mom. It was a crazy apron over her head. But it impacted them on, I need to be with Jesus. Again, I'll say to you parents, much like I did with Ms. Dargetz, don't underestimate the example that you're giving to your kids. Don't underestimate the silly little things like an apron over your head, men. <laughs> Only. If you have an issue with the apron comment, Josh will be available <laughs> afterwards to field any of your questions about the church. <laughs> but it's more than just being alone. It's being together. You know this. If you've been on a mission trip, if, you, if you've been to church where there's a prayer meeting, there, there's power in numbers. There's power in being together. Let's look at the New Testament in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. These with all one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers, that is typical of what you would find in the early church gathering. Acts chapter 12, verse 12, when Peter got out of prison, it says that he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and they were watching the football game. 
Paul, Peter gets out of prison and he goes to this home and they're praying. They're praying together. And that is something we've lost. It's something that's, that's diminishing in our culture, much like bringing your Bible to church. It, it is a lost art. It's diminishing in our culture. It's why, as a church, we have decided to throw a stake in the ground of please bring your Bibles. Even if it just sits on your lap and you don't even look at it, there's power in that. Another diminishing uh, practice is getting together to pray. We live in a culture of individuality, of, of I'm going to pray in my own place, usually on the like ninth green as I'm golfing, that's my prayer time. Or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, the football game's on, so I'm going to pray right before the game. And we've lost this art of gathering to pray. The, this idea of getting together to pray, this is not advanced Christianity. This is not a 401, 501, 601 class. This is 101 class. Well, what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? I get together with others and I pray. And every Sunday morning here in this room at 9.15, we shut down everything and we pray. This morning, we had 32 of you join us in this room. We prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed, and then the worship team led us, and we walked this room, and we prayed over doors. We prayed over windows. We prayed for you by name. We prayed that the presence of Jesus be in this room from ceiling to floor and from wall to wall, that nothing be allowed into this room that is not of him. We prayed for Amelia. We prayed for students that are struggling getting back to school. We prayed for, for friends struggling with mental illnesses. We prayed for you. And every Sunday morning, worship practice stops, setting up for children's ministry stops, and we gather in this room, often on our knees or laying down before the stage, and we pray from 9.15 to 9.40. And you are invited. And I will continue to say at great risk of telling you what you should do, I will say this. If this is your church, I'm calling you to come at least once a month. I'm calling you to come join us in prayer. Why? Because this is what our family does. You need it. But you don't just need it. I need it. I need your prayers. Our kids need your prayers. The Lord needs you to come and to gather with other believers and to pray. Every Sunday morning. And if gathering for prayer on, on, a, on a group level isn't within your wheelhouse, isn't something that you're doing, I'm going to ask you, why not start next week? It's a great Sunday to start. I don't even know what the date is, but it's a great Sunday. The last point is that we pray long and we pray short. Sometimes you'll get into a rhythm where, man, you're just praying and praying and praying. Other times, man, it's a sniper shot. Both are beautiful, both are powerful, both are healthy, but get into the rhythm of doing both. If, if you're really good at these short little prayers, begin to train yourself for a little bit longer. Have a conversation with your God. Prayer is common, but it's not easy to define. Prayer is something that's so important for our lives as we grow, but sometimes it's hard to put our finger on exactly what it is more than just the spoken word. There's a French philosopher, Simone Weil, who wrote this, absolutely unmixed attention is prayer. I'll say that again. Absolutely unmixed attention is prayer. 
think about that for a while. How many times do we go into prayer and we're thinking about what's for lunch and we're late to this meeting and start thinking about politics or the Bears game coming up? We just do these things. Ralph Martin is the president of Renewal Ministries and he wrote this, prayer is at its root simply paying attention to God. Prayer is, at its root, simply paying attention to God. It's your state of being. It's when life is, is so hard here and now. When your marriage is crumbling, when your kids are out of control, when finances aren't adding up, when something horrific like Midland happens yesterday. I would tell you that's the same thing as gasping when the tear gas is entering into your lungs. It's that filthy air. It's the sin nature of this world and you're gasping. And prayer is the clean air that you breathe. Prayer is at the same time standing in the midst of the muck, but raising your head so high to breathe something clean and pure because you're desperate for it. And I want to encourage you this morning, as you go about your week, just think about prayer. I promise you, you have my word. If you start thinking about prayer more, you will pray more. If you begin to think about God more, if, just, if it just becomes a state of your being, you will pray more. But it takes work. Much like Randy isn't going to come up here and do 200 sit-ups. We don't have the liability coverage for that. He can train for that. And it's the same thing with prayer. You have to train your spiritual being, train your mind, train your soul that prayer is, is the thing you cannot live without. Because the same question applies this week as last week. If you are not relying on this book for your strength, day in and day out, if you are not relying on prayer for your strength day in and day out, what are you relying on? And if the answer is self, you're on very shaky ground. Prayer. Desperate for it. I'm going to have you stand and we're going to sing this song. There, there's a song, it's older, not older like in the early 1900s, like some of the old hymns. This is an older one for some of you. Some of you are going to recognize this song. I think it's the air I breathe. What is it? Breathe? breathe? Okay, it's breathe. The words to this song, my prayer all week has been that this would be your prayer. That the word of God becomes something that you are so desperate for. That, that prayer is something that you're so desperate for that you can't live without it. That you literally feel like you're in, in the barracks with tear gas and you're going to die if I don't get time with God in the Word and in prayer. I so long for you to experience that. Because the Word and the time with God is invaluable. And so together, let's sing this song. Let's listen to the words. If it's new for you, just listen. But may this be our prayer. Let's pray together. God, we love you. We desperately need more of you. We could go around this room and, and list out all the reasons why we're struggling And there's no magic potion. 
But there is hope. There is strength. There is love. There is support in the Word of God and in prayer, these first two spiritual disciplines that we are wrestling with. And God, you know our mission statement. You know that it's, it's our responsibility. The reason why we even exist as your church is to equip every single person to take the next step in becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. And for some in this room, much like last week with the word, this week, someone, some people, a few, a handful, all, we need to be bolstered in our time of prayer. And so as we go into a time of worship, God, allow us to remove the gas mask, to gasp for fresh air, and to only find that in you and nothing else. And it's in Jesus Christ's name that we pray and that we've gathered. Amen.